Amen. Is that good singing? When the Lord came to this world, God tells us in the golden text of the Bible, in the book of John chapter 3, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth or trusted in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then Jesus said out of his own mouth while he was de deployed upon this earth, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. Jesus, out of his own mouth, gives his mission and his message and his methodology. And that is that God sent him to mitigate something that had happened so many years ago. And Jesus is the culmination and the completement of the scheme of redemption. From the very beginning, the scriptures tell us in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God. Right there is a statement of power. God created the heavens and God created the earth. And what the Bible tells us there in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings that was written in retrospect. Moses was not there in the beginning. Moses was not there uh, during uh, the flood. He was not there at the call of Abraham. But God gave Moses all of these teachings in retrospect so he could let the children of Israel understand why they had been in, in bondage to the Egyptians for over 400 years. But as God revealed this unto him, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God hung the sun on nothing, placed the moon in its place, flung the stars out into the sky. In the beginning, God scooped out the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, and the ponds of this earth. In the beginning, God put the grass and the fruit-bearing trees upon the earth in order to keep everything in place. God made a firmament above to make sure that it was a habitable place, a habitable environment. Then once God had done those things, the Bible lets me know that God made creatures. God made creatures in the sea, creatures in the forest. God put creatures in the air because God made all of those living creatures. But then at a certain point, once God had looked and examined everything that he made, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father who plans all, the whole, God the Son who executes all. God the Holy Spirit who fulfills or brings order out of chaos. God the Godhead said, now let us, let us, a plurality, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. After the Godhead made that declaration that let us make man. The Bible lets me know that God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became, became a living soul, not a living creature, but a living soul. And God raised man up and placed him in that garden. The living creatures were given instinctive motivation. They had to act within their instinctive knowledge, within their instinctive teaching as God had made them. God gave man reason, gave him intelligence, gave him intuitiveness, gave him choice, and then gave him law so that he could make his own decisions. When we look at the Bible, it is written in comparative language. That means God compares those things that save with those things that destroy, those things that bring life to those things that bring death, those things that build to those things that tear down, those things that enlighten to those things that darken the mind with unintelligent decisions. God gave man law. God placed him in that garden and gave him, a, gave him one prohibition of all the things that you might eat 
on this earth. You are free to eat except the tree that is in the midst. And God put it in the middle so man couldn't say, I didn't know which tree you was talking about. God put the tree in the middle of the garden. At a certain point, God, in doing his quality assessment, said that there was one thing out of all the things that were good, there was one thing that was not good. The Bible says God looked at man and God made a statement. It is not good that man should be alone. Therefore, having made that statement, the Godhead has to act. God the Father who plans the Son, who executes, and the Holy Spirit who brings order out of chaos. These three divine personalities with one divine nature therefore decided that man needed a helpmate. So the Bible lets me know that God put man in a deep sleep. While he is in that sleep, he opened his side. From his side, he removed the rib, closed his side, and made or built it a different word. He built it a woman and brought her to his side, indicating she's not his slave nor his master, but another self brought alongside of him. Therefore, God, being the father of the bride, had already prepped Adam for the beautiful creation, the beautiful creation that he made. The culmination, the crown jewel of all that he made was the woman. He had already brought all the animals in front of Adam to say, you see anything you like, boy? No, sir, I don't see nothing I like. Therefore, God made the woman when he brought the woman to Adam Adam, in a fit of joy, in the Hebrew translation in our English Bible, it says now. But if you really want to know what Adam said, Adam said, wow. When he looked upon the woman, he said, now she is bones of my bones, and she is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, because she was taken out of Ish. Therefore shall a man leave. God allowed Adam to be the first prophet. Therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. On that day God created community. God created marriage. God created the family. God created society. Adam was born full grown Eve was created full, both of them were made and built it rather, full grown because God made them. They, neither of them had a father or a mother as we know father and mother, but God gave Adam the privilege of being that prophet. What does God want us to know and learn? As our brother said very ably last evening in his lesson, those things written aforetime are written for our learning. What does God want me to learn? God wants me to learn that when he created us, he created us to live forever. God made us and God don't make junk. God don't make mistakes. God don't make things that have to get recalled and go back to the factory and get updated and rebooted in new software. When God made man, God made man to live forever. All man had to do to live forever was to live right, obey God, maintain proximity to the tree of life and do what God told him to do. But you know what? You got an adversary. Too many of us fail to understand that this drama of life that is adversarial and you have an adversary. Go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 for me. And I want you to notice something that Peter, during his last days, Peter understood that he was going to be a martyr, that the church was going to be under fire, that there were those who were going to try to destroy us and tear us down and do everything possible. What in the world can Peter do? What can he say to help Christians be ready for what's getting ready to happen to them? In the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, Peter said to the brethren, what? Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Is that right? Be watchful. Be, be vigilant. You don't have King James, brother. Be sober, <laughs> be vigilant. He said, because your adversary, what does he call him? The devil. 
as a, as a roaring lion who walketh about seeking, seeking, seeking whom he may devour. In essence, don't you understand you're being stalked? You're being stalked every day of your life. You're being stalked. You don't have off time where you can let your hair down, let your guard down, and simply do what you want to do because you have an adversary. God calls him by name. His name is the devil. Well, let me tell you a secret. When you get it, Dean, that's uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. I want you to go to verse 9. God didn't tell you to run from the devil. He didn't tell you to run from the devil because the devil is not your superior. The devil is not your master. Stop lying on the devil. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. You did it because you wanted to do it. The scriptures tell us very clearly that sin is not in your drinking water. Sin is not in your DNA. Sin ain't floating around like COVID or virus. Sin is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Scriptures tell us that sin is transgression of God's law. And you have an adversary that is willing to take advantage each and every day of your life. Hold it, I'll be there in just a moment. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, as was read in your hearing just a moment ago, just a moment ago, the apostle Paul talking to the brethren and Ephesus, when Paul is trying to do everything possible to fortify those brethren, too many of us minimize, minimize the attraction and the influence of sin. Let me tell you all a secret. God never told you sin wasn't pleasurable. Amen. God never told you that sin wouldn't make you happy as we define happy. God never said that sin wouldn't make you rich. God never told you sin wouldn't make you popular. God never said that sin wouldn't make you powerful. None of those things have been said by God. What God has told you is sin will bring you punishment. And you will be punished if you die in your sins. For this reason, Peter is warning the brethren of an adversary. Paul is warning the brethren. He said in Ephesians chapter 6, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand. Notice what Paul said. Against, stand against. It's a war. Like a Roman soldier standing against the enemy. Stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles comes from a Greek term which means the tactics, the seductions, the lies. The devil's trying to figure you out. He's trying to figure out the price of your sellout. He's trying to figure out what you're afraid to lose, who you're afraid to disappoint. He's trying to figure out who you love more than you love God. That's what the wiles of the devil are. He's trying to figure out your programming so that he can program you to lose your soul. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He said, for we wrestle not against what? Against flesh and blood. Read. But against what? Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Where? In high places. In other words, the Lord said, you're not fighting Leroy, Bubba, Cockroach, and Skillet. you fighting the devil. It's the devil that you're standing against. And you've got to understand why we are always pointing out people. That guy standing there with a sign on the expressway or with a bottle inside of a brown bag like you don't know what's in there. That's not the enemy. He's already in the devil's prison camp. Amen. You are liberators. Your job is to liberate that individual. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He says, therefore, don't you understand? You got to put on the helmet of salvation. You got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You got to have your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the truth 
of peace. You got to have the shield of faith that you can quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And your one offensive weapon, everything else is defensive. Your one offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So therefore, in verses nine of first Peter, chapter five, when Peter is speaking to the brethren after he has said to them, be sober, be sober, be sober, be sober. Don't get drunk with pride. Don't get drunk with materialism. Don't get drunk with worldliness. Don't get drunk with lasciviousness. Don't get drunk with the things of this world. Be sober. Be vigilant. Keep your eyes open. Why are you always getting ambushed? Why are you always saying, didn't see that coming? Why are you always saying, don't you understand? Stop complaining about the clowns. Ask yourself why you keep going to the circus. You got so many of us who are constantly looking for someone else and blaming someone else for the decisions that we make. He said, be sober, be vigilant, open your eyes. If someone's showing you the worst of themselves, see it. If they're showing you that they're a liar, learn it. If they're showing you that they're disloyal, understand it. Be sober, be vigilant. He said, because your adversary is behind it. And he calls him by name the devil. But does he tell us to run from him? No. What does he say in verses 9? Read it for me. He says, what now? Resist, 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 fight. Stop laying down and letting the devil walk all over you. The Lord said, you are the salt of the earth. You are. Not the politicians who don't love the Lord. Not the religionists and theologians who don't study the Bible. Not the rich folks, the corporate big shots. God didn't send them to save the world. He sent you. Amen. He sent you. He didn't send academia. He didn't send the medical profession. He sent you. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Don't you understand what salt is? Back in that day, the Greek, the, it was called solarium. That's the Greek or Latin word for salt. Salt didn't come in little blue boxes with a little girl with an umbrella. Salt was rocks. And you would buy salt in rocks. And you would chip off what you want and crumble it up and beat it up and powder it to sprinkle it over your food. Salt was called white gold. It was so valuable. Many Roman soldiers were paid their wages in salt. That's how valuable salt was. It was called white gold. And the word salarium is where we get the word salary. Getting your salary. When you heard it say that man is not worth his salt, that's where it came from. When a Roman soldier was not holding up his end, they would say that man is not worth his salt. He's not worth his salary. Are you worth your salary? Are you worth your salt? The Lord said, you're the salt of the earth. And he said, what good is salt when it has lost its savor? What is the Lord saying? Salt is a rock. If it gets wet, if it can't salt, if it can't savor, if it can't flavor, he says, it's just a dead rock. You put it down on the road like gravel and you walk over it and run your, your, your wagons over it. That's what he means to be trodden under the feet of men because it's just a dead rock that doesn't savor. The Lord said, you're the light of the world. You're the, uh, to illuminate the world by the way in which you live. So Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, he calls him by name the devil as a roaring lion who walketh about seeking whom he may desire, uh, may, whom he may devour. When Paul spoke to Titus, Titus, he had left at Crete. In the book of Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, when Paul said to him and said, and wanted them to understand that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. All men doing what? Teaching us. Doing what? 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, how should we live? We should live soberly, righteously, godly, godly where? In In this present world, soberly, your responsibility to yourself. What do you do for yourself? You live soberly. You don't get drunk with the things of this world. You live soberly, righteously. That's your responsibility to your brothers. What do you do to your brothers? You love them. You care for them. If they're hungry, you give them food. Thirsty, you give them drink. Naked and in prison, you clothe them and visit them. Righteousness, godly, your responsibility to your creator. In essence, every one of us in this world have a responsibility. Therefore, go, if you will, to the next slide. The prophet Isaiah heard from God, and God had asked a question of Isaiah and wanted Isaiah and Ezekiel both had similar questions that were asked of them. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I want you to notice verses 8. Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 8. What did Isaiah hear from the Lord? Read it for me, if you will. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Read it again. Whom shall I send? Read it again. Whom shall I send? God is saying, I'm looking at the world down there. Back in the antediluvian days, when God realized, as the Bible tells us there in Genesis chapter 6, that God came down and made an inspection of the world. God looked at man and said, his every thought and his every imagination was only sin continually. God decided he was going to clean things up, but he got to send somebody to tell him that he was going to do it. So God sent Noah, saved his family, told him to build an ark. And for 120 years, Noah preached, it's going to rain, children. It's going to rain, children. Get yourself right because it's going to rain. Why? Because God must always be kind and loyal and just and loving. And God will always try to save the righteous and not destroy them with the wicked. Who will he send? When it was time to kill and destroy Sodom, the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, because of the sin, the stench of nasty sin that had gone up to the nostrils of God, God had to send somebody to say, I'm going to burn this thing down. Send Abraham down there and to tell him, I'm going to burn it up. Abraham, who was God's friend. God said, Abraham, this, Abraham said to God, does not like you, God. Does not like you, God. You know that you're a good God, a loving God. If I find 50, God, will you save them? God said, yeah, I'll save them for 50. What about 40, God? If I find 40, will you save them for 40? God said, I'll save them for 40. Uh, what about 30, God? What if I find 30? What if I find 20? God said, I'll save them for 20. Uh, God, what about 10? What if I find 10? God said, if you find 10 souls among those twin cities that I have already examined the heart of every man, woman, and child down there, that I know everything and everybody there, if you can find 10 folks that I missed, (laughs) I'll save them for 10. Guess what? You couldn't find 10. And God destroyed them, but God sent somebody to them. Abraham, as Isaiah said, who shall I send? God's sending you. He's sending you. Read it for me, if you will, the dean. And who will go for us? Who will go for us? Who will go and stand before the little nasty children who nobody's raising and caring for? Who will go and stand before that individual that's caught in addictions and have no control of their faculties? Who will go for that little girl who's been called out of her name her entire life and all she knows is to be a promiscuous because nobody has helped her even learn anything about herself? Or the young man that's never been taught to be a man. God said, who shall I send? What did the old prophet say? 
Then said I, I, hear my my Lord, hear my Lord, send me. How many of you have said, hear my Lord, send me? Hear my Lord, send me. You've been good to me, Lord, send me. You put a roof over my head, Lord, all my life, send me. You fed me every day of my life, Lord. Send me, Lord, I got two or three vehicles, send me. How many of us have stepped back when we see what is happening in the world and said, here am I, Lord, send me, send me, I'll go. Too many of us sitting down on the seat to do nothing, leaning back on the elbows or do less, talking about wake me up when the battle is over. God has sent you to battle and he has told you to stand and he has commanded you to be a sacrifice. In the book of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and verses 2, when the apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Rome, Paul said, I beseech you, I beseech you, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present yourself, present yourself, present your body. God shouldn't have to beg us and barter with us and bargain with us and chase us down to get us to do. No, he said, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And what does he say in that very next verse there, Dean? What does he say? He said, be not conformed. Don't conform. Don't conform. Don't conform. Do not conform to this world. But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. By changing your mind. Too many of us want stuff to change on the outside before we change stuff on the inside. You want stuff to change? You got to change. And until you change, nothing is going to change. You have to change. And go on to that next verse in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22. And verses 30, Ezekiel said, I saw the man among them that should make up the hedge, that shall put a fence. My daddy, when we were boys, when I was a child, I I don't know if you ever remember this or not, but daddy used to walk to the side of the pulpit and he would draw an imaginary line in the sand. You've heard me say this before. And he said, you tell the devil, men, you tell the devil, mamas and daddies, It don't go another further. It stops right here. Your home ought to be a hedge against those things that destroy children, Mm -hmm. those things that destroy marriages, those things that destroy lives, those things that destroy moralities, those things that destroy professions, destroy businesses, those things that destroy, you need to put a hedge He said, read it again, and I saw the man among them that what now? Make up the heads heads and do what? And stand in the gap gap before me for the land. Which of you changed the slide? Who will stand in the gap? Who stands in the gap? How many folks are going along to get along? How many folks are going, well, you know, we got to do what we got to do when we do what we got to do. Who stands in the gap? Who stands like Joshua stood? Joshua on his deathbed. This man was just as strong as he was when he fought the enemy, when he led them across the Jordan. He said to the people, if it seemed evil for you to serve the Lord, choose, 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 choose. Problem with too many of us in the church today is we haven't chosen sides yet. We're still straddling the fence. We're a little of this and a little of that. We can do this and do that. I can take this and I can take that. Because you haven't chosen sides yet. Joshua said, choose this day, this day, right now. Choose who you will serve. He said, if you want to go back and be slaves, too many of us, you can free us from slavery, but can't take the slavery out of us. Amen. You say you bury the old man and you bring the slave meant to sin out of the water with you. Amen. He said, if you want to go back and be slaves, do it. You want to worship the gods around us, do it. 
He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you made a personal affirmation to your Lord and your father of commitment? I will serve the Lord. And there is nobody that's going to turn me around. Have you made such a commitment to your Lord and your father in heaven? Let me tell you something that, you know, we got to have a mentality and attitude of a line. How long I've been talking. Huh? Let me I'm talk about 20 more minutes. OK, is that too much? <laughs> All right. OK. <laughs> I didn't bring my phone up here with me with my and, and this watch is worthless. <laughs> so you got to understand there, there are so many things that we have to understand about ourselves, our attitude, our attitude will determine how far we go and how committed we are within our lives. Your attitude. When you think about it, have you ever looked at a lion? Why is a lion called the king of the jungle? He's not the biggest. There are plenty of animals bigger than the lion. He's not the fastest. A cheetah and leopards can outrun him. He's not the smartest. Chimpanzees and orangutans are smarter and closer to human mentality than he is. He's not the tallest. A giraffe is the tallest, but he's the king because of his attitude. When the lion comes, everybody runs because the lion, he looks at these animals and he sizes them up and say, I can eat that. I, yeah, I can eat that. And they're going to all run because of his attitude. And what we as Christians have got to do is change our attitude. We've got to have the mentality, the attitude that the lion has that, oh, yeah, I can defeat the devil. I can save this child. I can strengthen this family. I can convert this young man, this young woman. I can change this community. I can work within this school system. I can be an individual that can hold this job down and let my light shine at the same time. In essence, you've got to have that attitude. Let me tell y'all something. An army of lions led by a sheep. Have you told them this before? Will always be defeated by an army of sheep led by a lion. Amen. An army of sheep led by a lion will destroy an army of lions led by a sheep. Amen. And what we've got to have is a mentality of a lion. And this is what God wants us to realize. You got to stand in the gap. Go to the next one real quick. I'm going to run through these because as leaders, we've got to be ethical. We've got to be biblical. We've got to be the type of people who allow the word of God to lead and counsel us. In the book of Psalms chapter 1, when David, who became a better leader after making terrible mistakes, David said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law doth he meditate day and night. What is David talking about? The progressiveness of sin. When you start walking with listening to sinners and walking with sinners and standing with sinners, you find yourself sitting with sinners. David started as a peeping Tom and ended up in an adulterer and a murderer. Why? Because of the progressiveness of sin. The devil wants you to stay long enough to hook you. This is why James said one time, he said, stop lying on God. Stop lying on God. He said, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. He said, no, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. For every man is tempted when, James, when he is drawn away, drawn away by his own lust and is enticed. When you allow your desire and your lust to lead you away from God, you've got to understand something, brothers and sisters. 
Here's what I want to get in the remainder of the lesson. Stop devaluing yourself. Stop looking for mediocrity. Stop acting as though you've made no contribution. Stop acting as though our ancestors, my father was a Korean War veteran. Many of your fathers and uncles and brothers and grandfathers were veterans and grandmothers and aunts were also veterans. You've been paying the price for this nation for many, many years. And too many of us are willing to throw our hands up and not strive for the best for our children. Your child, these babies throughout this audience deserve a whole lot better than we're offering. Change the slide for me there. Deserve a whole lot better than we're offering them. I, on one occasion, I remember I was sitting on the floor of the house, Edward, and they gone on and on and on about ridiculous stuff. I threw my hands up and I walked off the floor angry. I said, it's not worth saving. I've fought for years and years for various principles, fighting against abortion, fighting against the, the uh, make legalize and various things, fighting against homosexuality, fighting against the, uh, the school systems and certain things being taught. And I threw my hands up and I walked off the floor and said, I'm tired. I, I called George and said, I'm not going to run again. I've had enough. And God got me real good. You know what God did to me? He gave me grandchildren. <laughs> and when I looked at those grandchildren, when that grandchild wrapped over 20 years ago, wrapped her little hand around my finger, I said, okay, God, I got it. I see it. Don't you know if you don't fight for Nico and all these babies we're pushing around in the strollers right now, what kind of world are they going to have if we don't fight for them right now? Amen. What kind of country are they going to have if you don't stand right now? Amen. What kind of place they're going to have to live in? What type of school system they're going to be educated in? If you just throw your hands up and say, I give, don't you understand that in 1956 and again in 1963, Castro said, we're going to take your country. We're going to take your country country and he said we're going to take it without firing a shot because we're going to divide you from within. Martin Luther King made this statement before he died and it's one of the most profound things he said for those of us who get caught up in the past instead of leaving the past. Let me tell you something about an eagle. An eagle flies high. He can see his prey from five miles away. Before the prey can see him, he sees the prey. And he hones in on the prey, and when he swoops, that prey don't have a chance because of the eagle's vision. Eagles don't run from the storm. They love the storm because they have the ability to fly high in the storm. The more the storm becomes violent, the higher the eagle can fly within the storm. Let me tell you something else about an eagle. An eagle don't eat dead stuff. He catches his prey alive. He's not a buzzard. He's not some scavenger, but he chases, he flies, and he catches his food alive. Too many of us are living in the past. Stop living in the past. You cannot unwrite history. You cannot rewrite history. All you can do is learn from history and write a better future. Amen. Get off the ship. Get off the ship. We may have come on different ships, but right now we're in the same boat. If America goes, it goes for everybody. Amen. If the enemy takes this country, he takes it for everybody. When you go to Egypt, what do you see? Ruins. They used to be a superpower. When you go to Greece, what do you see? Ruins. They used to be a superpower. When you go to Babylon, what do you see? Ruins. They used to be a superpower. The media Persians, ruins. The Roman Empire, ruins. The Colosseum and all the architecture, the, arch the aqueducts, ruins. 
Wouldn't it be something if one day some child is looking at a ruin land in New York Harbor and say, Mama, what's that? Oh, that, well, that used to be the Statue of Liberty, but it was blown up about 50 years ago. Well, what's that? That used to be the Washington Monument, but it was shot over about 30 years ago. What's that? That used to be the White House. Wouldn't it be something? It's because we take our eyes off the prize and we fight each other. Change the slide for me. And we fight each other. Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first to say it. Jesus was the first to say it. Amen. That a house divided against itself, against itself, Amen. cannot stand. I said earlier, y'all Bible scholars, you know, I can quote the Bible. Dean quotes it. Edward, all your fine elders and the preacher to preach last night. You know the Bible. Let's apply it to the point that we understand what our responsibility is as salt and as light in this world. A house divided against itself cannot stand. You go to the school systems and they're teaching the black kid to hate the white kid, the white kid to hate the Hispanic kid, the Hispanic kid to hate the Asian kid, the Asian kid to hate the Native American kid, and then all of them learn to hate each other. Let me tell you something. A man will not die for that which he does not believe. Amen. We teach him to hate the flag, hate the Constitution, hate Washington, hate the Senate, hate everything about America. And then when the enemy gets ready to come, you're going to tell him, here, boy, take this gun. Here, little girl, take this uniform and go fight for this country. No. You've already taught them that this country is not worth existing. You've already taught them that this country is no good. So why in the world Peter didn't, Peter was not afraid. Peter lost his faith. Peter was not going to die for what he didn't believe. When Jesus gave himself up to die, Peter said, no, I can't go along with you like that. I uh, know. Can't go along with you with that. So Peter said, no, I don't know him three times. Why? Because he was scared. In the garden, Peter would have gone down fighting. He would have gone down fighting with that sword. But he could not let his hands down when he had lost his faith. Change the slide for me, if you will. I'm going to go on and get through. Liberty once lost is lost forever, John Adams said. This man hated a lot of the things that were happening in the South. He hated what was happening when he watched the White House being built. And one of the things that he said in, and, and he talked about was liberty, liberty for everybody. But one of the things that he said that resonated with me, once it's lost, it's lost forever. Go to the next slide. Dwight Eisenhower, the man who integrated the schools in Little Rock, the man that my father served under. This man, the supreme quality of leadership is unquestionably integrity. What without it, no real success is possible. No matter whether it is on a section gang, somebody building a ship, a football field, the army or in the office, integrity, something that's being lost. We'll sit and listen to politicians who we know have no integrity. I can look to the left, I see no integrity. I can look to the right, I see no integrity. What you've got to do is have integrity yourself. Amen. And you've got to look at what you are supporting. Because God said, don't support other men's sin. Go to the next one, if you will. Righteousness, Solomon said, exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach. It is a shame to any people. Go to the next one, if you will. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people suffer. That word mourn comes from a Hebrew word, which means to suffer. Go to the next slide, if you will. Booker T. Washington said it's character, not circumstances that make a man. This man rose up from slavery, rose up from slavery. And because of his character, his integrity, his courage, he went all over the world fighting slavery and fighting the things that were happening in the southern part of the United States of America. Why? Because of his character, his character, his character. Too many of us get caught 
in the point of origination and we never get to our destination because you don't have the care. If, let me tell you something. If you hate starting over all the time, then stop quitting. Amen. Stop quitting all the time. If you stop quitting, you don't have to start all over all the time. Go to the next slide. Booker T. Washington said, a lie doesn't become the truth. Wrong doesn't become right. Evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. Stop looking at what the majority is doing and look at what Christ told you. Amen. Stop supporting what the majority supports Amen. and start supporting what the Lord commanded you to support. Move on. I'll be through in a second. For the leaders of this people cause them the air and they that are led by them are destroyed. Jesus said it like this. Go to the next slide. Let them alone. When the apostles came to Jesus, they said, Jesus, you hurt their feelings. You hurt their feelings. Lord, you could have said that better than that. You could have not been so hard. You know what Jesus said? Leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind change the slide, if the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into the ditch. What we happen, see happening right now in this country are the blind leading the blind. God told you to take lead. He told you to stand fast. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 58, he said to the brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You are that line of demarcation. You are the last holdout. You are the last man standing. Everybody else is compromising. You stand. Change it if you will for me. Harriet Cubman, who saved a thousand slaves. She said one time, I saved a thousand slaves. I freed a thousand slaves. She said, I could have freed a thousand more if they had realized they were slaves. Amen. How many folks don't realize they're slaves? Amen. How many folks are captured in the devil's prison camp mm -hmm. and don't understand that they're enslaved? She said, you hear the dogs keep going. You see the torches keep going. When they shout at you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father except by me. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Change to the next one and the last one. I want you to realize that as Isaiah asked the question, he said, here am I, send me. I wanted to read you something before I sat down this morning because there was something that Eleanor Roosevelt wrote many years ago. Eleanor had a prayer that she kept in her wallet and the wallet and she would go every night as she would watch her husband as he was grappling with the deaths in World War II at that particular time. And she said, Lord, unless I remain in my complacent ways, as long as there is war, help me to remember that someone died for me today. And she said, as I contemplate this, may I find the courage to ask myself, am I worth dying for? The Bible tells us that Jesus died for our sins. He came to this world and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The scriptures let us know that he was beaten and scourged on the scourge and post, a crown of thorns upon his head, beaten half to death to the point that Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was trying to be his lawyer, was amazed at the fact that he was still standing. He was still standing. He was still standing. Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, took that scourging, took that beating. They beat his, him upside his head with a blindfold on his face. Jesus Christ was condemned, nailed on a cross, hung on a cross between two thieves on a garbage heap on the outskirts of Jerusalem. 
Jesus prayed to the Father, Father, release them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He took care of his mama. John, take care of my mama. He took care of a fellow sufferer. This night you will be with me in paradise. He called out to show his humanity. My God, why have you forsaken me? And I thirst. Jesus Christ on that cross eventually said, it is finished. Going back to what had happened in that garden, Jesus said, it is finished. And then Jesus died like no man has ever died before. Because the scriptures say, as John recorded, he was the only one there that he lowered his head and he gave up the ghost. I've stood beside the bed of many of our brothers and sisters over the years. My grandmother and my wife, uh, I've stood beside their bed as they have taken their last breath. And their head, their ghost leaves them and their head drops because the ghost has left them. Jesus chose the moment of his death. He chose the moment that he gave up the spirit. Pontius Pilate said, boy, I can save you. Jesus says, don't you understand? You don't take my life. I give my life. When you've heard that and believed it, when you repent of your sins, when you acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God, when you go to God in baptism, burying your old man because you've mortified the old man, anything dead need burying, and you bury that old man in the watery grave. The word resurrection comes from a Greek term which means to stand up again. And you stand up again, born again, born again. Every bad word as though you never said it. Every bad deed as though you never did it. That's a good deal, church. Amen. And you can live with the Lord forever in heaven. No sorrow, no sickness, no death. The Lord in his parabolic teaching gave the subject of the, the, the teaching of the, the metaphor of the, of the prodigal. The prodigal came home and his father received him. The Lord says, just come home. Just come home. Are you worth dying for? Are you standing in the gap? Are you God's child? Are you fighting the good fight? Great questions. Great questions. You have to answer them to God. Think about it while we stand and